The ceremony is on, Dr. Grijalva. Pardon me? We can start. We can start now? Yes. Okay. Welcome to the Marie Fielder Medal for Social Transformation Award Ceremony. My name is uh, Carlos Grijalva, and I serve on the Marie Fielder Center Advisory Council. It is my great pleasure to serve as the host of the award ceremony today, honoring the national leader in higher education and social justice advocacy, Dr. Orlando Taylor. In opening this special ceremony, I'd like to invite Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Dr. Allison Davis White Eyes, to offer the Global Land Acknowledgement. Welcome and greetings, dear colleagues. I am Allison Davis White Eyes, currently serving as the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and I am joining you from the lands of the Ampanefu Band of Kalapuya Indians in Corvallis, Oregon. Thank you for joining us for this celebratory event. As we engage in celebration, let us take the time to be mindful of the lands that we live on, work on, and share a common future with, indigenous lands. If you would take the time to drop in the chat the land upon which you currently reside, please join us in doing so. We have dropped nativeland.ca if you need to use the map finder to locate the indigenous homelands. As a globally distributed campus, Fielding Graduate University acknowledges, honors, and stands committed to indigenous communities as the original stewards of the lands that we all inhabit. We stand in support of acknowledging the history, sovereignty, scholarship, and the future of indigenous nations around the world, their elders, both past and present, as well as their future generations of emerging leaders. As a globally distributed learning institution with a reach that spans six continents, Fielding Graduate University commits to the following. We commit ourselves to promoting educational opportunities in partnership with indigenous peoples worldwide who are interested in advancing educational and professional opportunities in our areas of expertise. We commit ourselves to consulting and cooperating in good faith with indigenous peoples through their own representative institutions in order to provide opportunities for knowledge production or any other project affecting lands, territories, or knowledge resources. We commit ourselves to promoting and protecting the rights of indigenous peoples by actively promoting the scholarship of indigenous communities through Fielding Graduate University Press. And last, we recognize and acknowledge that traditional knowledge cannot be separated from natural and cultural resources. And as such, all indigenous knowledge should be protected and respected. By centering indigenous communities, knowledge, tradition, and worldviews, we are working in partnership in order to enhance the next generation of global leadership committed to building a more just and sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis White Eyes. The Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership and Education was established in 2006 to honor the legacy and work of Fielding's founding faculty member, scholar of social justice and civil rights advocate, Dr. Marie Fielder. Dr. Fielder was an extraordinary pioneer in education and social justice. She contributed to the work of the civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King Jr. and Whitney Young, and was among the founders of Fielding Graduate University. I'm delighted to invite Fielding alum and public trustee, Dr. Keith Yearly, to offer remarks on the legacy of Dr. Fielder and offer his reflection on the work of Dr. Taylor. First, a little bit about Dr. Yearly. Dr. Early is an organization development consultant with a broad range of corporate experience. He is a passionate advocate of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Early has a PhD in human and organization systems from Fielding Graduate University. He has master's degrees in organizational development from Fielding and from American University. Keith is a graduate of Rutgers Law, uh, University Law School and completed his undergraduate work at Cornell University. 
He has a long time, he has been a long time trustee of, at Fielding and is a supporter of the Marie Fielder Center. Dr. Early, I invite you to speak now. Thank you so much. I have to stop and um and, and reflect sometimes on my on my on my career. Uh, and it's uh it's been a, a long one and fruitful. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Grihava. Um, I'm honored to have this opportunity to say a few words about Dr. Taylor, the award of the Marie Fielder Medal, um, Fielder Medal for Social Transformation, and the legacy of Dr. Fielder, as it's carried on by my colleague and friend, Orlando Taylor. I'd like to frame my comments based on the assumption that you already know a lot about Dr. Taylor because you can look him up. And, um, and if there's ever someone whose reputation precedes him, it certainly is Dr. Taylor. So I actually view this as an opportunity to personalize Orlando. And I'd like to sit to do so by offering a perspective that's based on three considerations, let's say. Uh, first, I want to start by framing what's not in his bio. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is something that I frequently will will do uh, with my clients and with my my students when I'm teaching, um, and so it gives a more personal kind of perspective on 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 the gentleman. Second, I'd like to say a few things about his body of work that has culminated in this award. Ah, I'm so sorry. I thought I turned my phone off. Um, and, um, and then from there, I'd like to say a few things about his body of work that has culminated in, culminated in this award. And then finally, I want to share more personal um, observations in terms of my relationship with Dr. Taylor. So what's not in his bio? <laughs> I've known Orlando dating back to 2014 when he joined Fielding. And over this time, I've been able to learn a lot about him, both personal and, pro and professional. But as I thought about this occasion, I really wanted to sort of unpack the personal pieces of, of uh, his history. So I was, a curious, I was curious about his history, about his influences, and about the things that shaped his orientation in life. And I learned a lot. Um, of course, it starts with family. Uh, I knew Orlando was a proud father of his son, Orlando, who they call Lanny, and his daughter, Ingrid. Both are local, so he sees them regularly. I knew about his brother, with whom Orlando shared a very, very close relationship throughout his brother's 76 years before he passed some years ago. Of course, I didn't know about his parents. Um, and if there's ever a story of inspiration that explains so much about Orlando, it is a story of his father and his mother. Mm. His father, imagine this, a man who worked in steel mills um, in his life. And despite the challenges of growing up as a black man at that time, he was able to rise to the ranks of a supervisor, and he is—he was what Orlando describes as a land, uh, sorry, a lay engineer. He was a strong black man. How strong, you ask? Well, he smoked unfiltered cigarettes. I mean, who does? He was, like, camel cigarettes, really. <laughs> All his life, and drank straight gin, and lived to ninety-one. <laughs> How about that? Um, so he was more than that, though. He was a man of principle and character. And so you can see that the apple did not fall far from that tree. But his mother, an absolutely fascinating woman who lived a long life as well, 99 years. She was raised in rural Alabama. Her father, Lando's grandfather, was biracial. And his father, her father, um, um, his father, I'm sorry, was a white farmer who ultimately gave land to to our, um, um, Orlando's mother's father. Keep up with it, it'll, it'll, it'll make sense in a minute. Um, but the point is this, um, Orlando's grandfather had a third grade education, but he read the newspaper every day. And importantly, every one of his six children went to college. It's just astonishing, which brings me to his mother, Orlando's mother. In rural Alabama, she committed herself to education and completed a degree at a junior college while living in Alabama at that time. That alone is worth the price of admission, but let's go further. When Orlando's parents decided to leave Alabama, they moved to Chattanooga, which is where Orlando was born. After taking time to raise a family, his mother decided to return to school where at 40 years old, she completed her undergraduate degree and, and received a BA. By this time, Orlando had been accepted at the University of Indiana working on his master's degree. He then invites his mother to the university where she enrolls and they both pursue and complete their, their, their master's degrees. Think about that. 
<laughs> it's an astonishing story. So just to round out the picture, Orlando's mother went on to complete another graduate degree at 55 years old. <laughs> Her mother was a prototype for the fielding student. <laughs> she was a lifelong learner who inspired Orlando to do the very things that drive him today. It is an absolutely remarkable story. Hmm. So Orlando's career then, following graduation from IU, included a stint at the State Department of Mental Health. I think that was in Indiana as well. Uh, he, and he went on to complete his PhD from the University of Michigan. And he returned to IU to teach at 25 years old. He also served on the faculty council and developed close relationships with many of the black students. So he was both a faculty member and a teacher. These were, of course, tumultuous times. And when students engaged in protests, including a takeover of a, of a council meeting where faculty were not allowed to leave, the students were executed and Orlando. They were all prosecuted. They were indicted and tried, but ultimately acquitted. So I share all of these things because they speak powerfully and poignantly to the precursors of all that Orlando is today. And they frame his journey to Howard as well, where he, where he ended up for 35 years, ultimately becoming the Dean of, graduate, of, of the graduate school, leading 35 PhD and 40 master's programs. They shaped his move to Chicago School of Professional Psychology, where he stayed for five years before accepting Katrina's offer to join Fielding in 2014. So Katrina knew Orlando because in 2008, she had asked him to assist field with Fielding's reaccreditation process, working with Dr. Charles McClintock. The day she was appointed president of Fielding, she called Orlando <laughs> and asked him to join Fielding. <laughs> How do you like those apples? Um, so we see that there, there was a, a, a the, the trajectory of Orlando's life took him to exactly this very moment in, in time. It's a, it's a beautiful story. My relationship with Orlando is quite special. We met as I approached the completion of my doctorate and he wasn't simply interested in my work. He was active, he was an active supporter and he encouraged me at every, at every turn uh, during that process and after and has been so ever since. We've shared wonderful times together discussing a wide range of subjects. He's been a major supporter of my work as a board member and as committee chairs as well. We emailed him and heck, Orlando and I even, he even invited me to a hockey game. And so, because he's a huge sports fan. And so we've, we, we, we've had those kinds of experiences as, as well. So, what can we say about the essential qualities that define this man? He offers a sober, clear-eyed assessment of the challenges we face as individuals in our institutions of higher education and as a society. He has an inherently systemic and deeply strategic orientation, and he understands what's at stake in the context of higher education. But everything I've shared about Orlando makes his vision for the founding of the Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership, and Education a logical and compelling part of his legacy. He's the kindred spirit, and he's a logical extension of Marie Fielder, whose passion for transformational change is reflected in his work today. We're challenged to respond today to reactionary forces that, sh that seek to reshape education at every level. Consider the implications of transformational change as reflected in topics examined by the Chronicle of Higher Education over the course of the last year or so. And here are some titles. After Affirmative Action, The Imperiled Future of Race-Conscious Admissions. Why Faculty Color Are Leaving Academe. Too Many Find Themselves dis Disenfranchised, Exhausted, and Isolated. Role in a College-Going college Landscape. The Elephant in the Room, When Politicians Meddle in Public Universities, how should administrators <laughs> higher education is on the ballot? So it's about, but but it's about more than higher education because there is, I, there was an article I read yesterday in the Washington Post describing how the Virginia Department of Education's new stand, what those new standards of, of learning are. So, and if approved, they will radically reshape what 
what and how K-12, K-12 students in the state learn about history and social lessons. So why mention that? Transformational change requires an understanding of the entire educational process and the deeply strategic elements of conservative, what I call conservative wokeism. Hmm. Right. And so it's against this backdrop that we have to understand the critical role and the importance of the work of the Marie Fielder Center. And it's against this backdrop that we can understand how Dr. Taylor does what he has done throughout his life. In sum, Orlando's body of work is essential to these conversations. He's a visionary who has sacrificed comfort in service of his passion to make a difference. He's widely known and respected. He's a person who, has ex who hasn't expressed a desire to leave a legacy as much as he has taken actions that themselves define his legacy. And he's not done. The notion of having a legacy while you're building is something that's more than noteworthy. Actually, I think it's great. On top of these things, Orlando is, technically speaking, a cool guy, <laughs> a man's man with eclectic interests, sophisticated, urbane, politically savvy. There's a term in the Urban Dictionary that aptly describes Orlando. When someone says he's all that, it means superior, admired, a cut above, possessed with the qualities envied by other by one's peers. Orlando is too was far too humble to say that about himself, but it's true. This award is our way of acknowledging that Dr. Orlando Taylor is indeed all that. Thank you, Orlando, my friend. Thank you, Dr. Early. Your remarks and your reflection on Orlando in the context of Marie Fielder are absolutely enlightening. I always learn something new and important about our good friend. Uh, he is truly a giant uh, among uh, not only men, but the whole educational community. And we're so thrilled that he is part of our lives today and will be a part of history uh, down the road. The center envisions thanking the awardee today, of course, Dr. Orlando Taylor and uh, President Katrina Rogers will share the significant role Dr. Taylor has played at the center, creating a collaborative place for the university to engage in research and learning on democracy, leadership, and education. Dr. Rogers is the seventh president of Fielding Graduate University. In the course of her career, she has served the international non-governmental and educational sectors in many roles, including executive, board member, and teacher. She led the European campus for the Thunderbird School of Global Management in Geneva, Switzerland for a decade, working with international organizations such as the Red Cross, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations Developmental Program, and the European Union. She also developed externships for students at several companies, including Renault, Nestle, and Euro Disney, which is now Disneyland Paris. She has doctorates in political science and history. Her recent book, co-authored with Dr. Bill Flores, is titled Democracy, Civil Engagement, and Citizenship in Higher Education. So I'm very pleased to invite Dr. Rogers to comment on uh, Professor Orlando Taylor and his legacy. Thank, th thank you, Dr. Grijalva. And thank you, Trustee Early. What, what beautiful remarks. And, and I wish I could, we were in person. I would give you all virtual right now, just virtual hugs. And of course, greetings to everyone who is here and able to hear us live in this important occasion to honor Orlando, Dr. Orlando Taylor. Dr. Taylor has so many titles and awards bestowed upon him over the years. Honestly, if I were to recount them all, and as Trustee Early has said, you can look them up. If I were to recount them all, we'd be here until the new year. <laughs> and yet he's also a humble human being. And he's one of the most humble people that I've had the honor to associate with in my many years in higher education. And, and I know that that you are here today, Orlando, feeling a little shy about the things that we are saying about you, but it is a, a measure of respect and a sense of the importance of learning from others that we are here today to honor you for your work. And it's not as if your work's over. We're, we're quite aware we are continuing. We are continuing the struggle. It's a particularly full heart for me that I can continue today to talk a little bit about you. 
Um, Dr. Taylor is a visionary with a singular focus on advancing people of color, including African Americans and women. His voice remains steadfast to broaden participation in our society. And the idea that the dreams of an inclusive America can only be realized by raising our collective voices above the fray, that we have a responsibility to claim our own moral authority, and that each of us are made stronger when we all have the same rights and benefits. And as you have heard already, Dr. Taylor has been a national leader for many years on issues pertaining to diversity and inclusion, both a strong voice and also a leader in higher education. Among many honors, I just want to point out that he served as the chair of the board of the prestigious Council of Graduate Schools. And I think some of our colleagues from CGS are here with us today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chell has been a particularly vigorous advocate and spokesperson on topics relating to access and equity in higher education and on preparing the next generation of researchers, leaders, and faculty members for the nation's colleges and universities. And yes, it is a true story that the first person I called when I was appointed president by the board of Fielding Graduate University was Orlando, because I thought here was a man with vision, with a sense of purpose, uh, a true under, a true visionary and someone that not only is visionary, he gets things done. And just by way of demonstrating that, he is a, a co-investigator and executive director on a major national science foundation project, which conducts research and advances the development of a new generation of leaders in the STEM fields throughout the U.S. with a focus on HBCUs, includes tribal colleges as well. And Fielding, in our way, is very proud to be a part of this work. As another indication of his vision and getting things done, alongside Fielding faculty member Nicola Smith, who is the daughter of Dr. Marie Fielder, Dr. Taylor helped to found and envision the center, the Marie Fielder Center, and the medal itself as ways to honor the legacy of Dr. Marie Fielder and also acknowledge leaders who advocate for democracy, education, and racial justice. So it is fitting that we also confer, confer the medal upon Orlando today. Just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Fielder, she was a national advocate and activist for the inclusion of African-Americans into every aspect of American life, as Dr. Grijalva mentioned. She's, she had a great vision and commitment to justice throughout her lifetime and her 60-year career. And although I did not meet her, she was an early board member at Fielding. I did not know her. I was not part of Fielding then. I feel like I know her through the stories that so many of her colleagues and the people who love her tell to today. That like Orlando, she had a grace, uh, a singularity of purpose, and, and people she influenced and loved people far and wide. She inspired many and left an indelible mark on the entire nation. In the 60s and 70s, for example, she contributed to the work of such civil rights leaders as Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Whitney Young of the National Urban League. The breadth of her work to achieve racial equity with numerous governmental and civil rights organizations was enormous. And in this regard, she also worked with the Black Panther Party and served as an advisor on racial matters to the Los Angeles Police Department as well as multiple corporate organizations. As you can see, she was everywhere, just like Dr. Taylor. Closer to home, that is California in this case, Dr. Fielder was one of the most influential women in the history of California education. She was a PhD recipient from the University of Chicago, first African-American woman with a doctorate to teach at a college or university in the San Francisco Bay Area. She was also one of the first researchers who documented cultural bias in IQ testing. She helped the Berkeley Public Schools become the first in the nation to desegregate through two-way busing. And she considered this one of her proudest accomplishments where white students were bused to predominantly black schools in Berkeley, California and vice versa. So as already mentioned, the Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership and Education was launched by Orlando and Nicola in 2016, in order to provide a multidisciplinary space for students, alumni, and faculty 
to engage in advocacy, education, and research, all with the intention to advance our university's commitment to seeking a just and inclusive society for our nation and by, by extension for all. So I wanna thank the Center's Advisory Council for their stewardship of the center and guidance over the years in selecting recipients of the Marie Fielder Medal for Social Transformation. And Dr. Grijalva, since you are our MC today, I wanna to thank you personally for your support of the conferral of this matter, medal upon Dr. Orlando Taylor. We have awarded it every year since 2016. This today marks the sixth awarding of the Marie Fielder Medal. And Dr. Taylor follows a distinguished group of previous awardees, including Dr. Walter Bumpus of the American Association of Community Colleges, Professor Gary Orfield of the UCLA Civil Rights Project, Professor Emerita Patricia Gurin of the University of Michigan, Ms. Dolores Huerta, co-founder with Cesar Chavez of the National Farm Workers Association, which later became the United Farm Workers, and most recently, during the pandemic, Professor Angela Davis, longtime civil rights activist and scholar. So today, in the spirit of acknowledging all those who dedicate their lives to fighting for justice, we honor Dr. Taylor by conferring the Marie Fielder Medal for Social Transformation in recognition of his lifetime achievement and mentoring and advocating for those who have been traditionally marginalized. So it is with great honor that I bestow this medal upon you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you for all that you've accomplished, for all that you are, and for all that you are becoming and will continue to do. I now turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, President Rogers. And Dr. Grijalva, uh, distinguished members of the Marie Fielder Advisory Council, thank you very much as well. And thank you, all of you in the virtual audience today. It's not often that I feel at a loss for words, but I think this is one of those times today to hear the uh, accolades and reflections of the various people who have spoken before me. I am deeply honored and humbled, frankly, by having been selected to receive this high honor. It is often said that one is rarely honored in one's own land. And so to be recognized in the name of Marie Fielder by my home university is one of the highlights of my professional life. I accept this high honor with deep gratitude to those who made the decision and especially to those in my personal and professional life or orbit who inspire me daily through their intellect, honor, integrity, and unwavering commitments to service and excellence. I dedicate this award to my two wonderful offsprings. My son, Orlando II, known as Lanny to many, of Frederick, Maryland, and my daughter, Ingrid, of College Park, Maryland. I love, honor, and thank you both for being the man and woman who you are today and for who you have been throughout the years, a source of great pride, constant inspiration, and immense motivation for me through your integrity, character, high standards for excellence, and love of family. I wish to also thank my many colleagues who have been so supportive over the years at Fielding at Howard University, and indeed around the nation and the world, many of whom are here today virtually, and especially to my DC colleagues. And I do, I do want to mention them, Dr. Nicole Moreland, Dr. Katie McGraw, Ms. Melissa Wynn, Ms. Kavita Freeman, Ms. Mary Emma Cisse, and Ms. Janine Robinson. I want to personally thank each one of you for your unswerving loyalty and commitment to our mutual quest for advancing excellence in the name of fielding and for putting up with me, <laughs> usually with a smile. I thank you each for your support in the work that we've tried to deliver together 
on behalf of Fielding and the several communities and institutions that we serve around the country. Receiving this honor today is even more special to me because it is bestowed in the name of the amazing and extraordinary life of service and accomplishments of an African-American woman whose name is etched in Fielding and California's, indeed our nation's history, as an uncompromising lifetime warrior in the quest for a just society for all humankind. It is an often overlooked fact that women in general and women of color in particular are omitted in the historical records or in the naming of prestigious awards by most, almost all institutions of higher education in the country. With few exceptions, mainly at women's colleges and a few minority serving institutions, very few I might add, the names of founding pillars of higher education institutions and awards given in their honor have been reserved for men, mainly white men, even at minority, many minority serving institutions. Fielding extricated itself from this exclusionary pattern by establishing in 2016 the Marie Fielder for Social Transformation to honor posthumously an amazing African-American woman who lived a beautiful life of service to humankind by deciding to bestow arguably the university's most prestigious annual award of recognition the Marie Fielder Medal for Social Transformation, upon an individual who had achieved national acclaim for advancing the cause of social justice through research, service, or advocacy. I'm extraordinarily proud to be associated with the university that has recorded the name of Marie Fielder into its historical record and has established a pathway for honoring her memory through the annual awarding of the Marie Fielder Medal and by the annual selection of cohorts from a refill of fellows, many of whom I hope are here today virtually, who in addition to their form of doctoral studies have dedicated themselves to research advocacy and special projects that seek to advance the goals of social justice that Marie Fielder pursued throughout her life. Thus, thus Fielding Graduate University is honoring of me today in the name of Marie Fielder with this medal is indeed a special, memorable moment for me. And frankly, I really can't find the precise words to express my gratitude and humility for having been selected for the medal. And thank you, descendants of Marie Fielder, notably Professor Nicholas Smith, for allowing the university to, to use the, her name of, into perpetuity as a beacon of hope and as an exemplar in the quest for social justice that is a part of Fielding's DNA, and also to empower current and future generations of Fielding students, faculty, and staff, and administrators to continue the quest to make social justice a reality in our nation and the world. The awarding of another Marie Fielder Medal today comes at a dark period in our nation's history. A throwback in many ways to earlier dark periods of racism, sexism, xenophobia, and outright divisiveness, and yes, even physical violence in the name of exclusion, not inclusion. It is a time when all of us need to recommit ourselves, like Marie Fielder, to keep on keeping on and doing the hard work in the pursuit of a just nation and world. In our darkest hours, it is imperative for each one of us to recommit ourselves, like Marie Fielder again, to unrelentingly pursue social justice every day and for everyone and in every sphere of life. And in these darkest hours, it is important for all of us to remember the statement attributed to the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who uttered it in the 1960s, which paraphrased a 19th century statement attributed to an abolitionist minister, the Reverend Theodore Parker, who was an influential transcendentalist and minister in the Unitarian Church. In Reverend Parker's statement, he said, quote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is long, my, eyes, my eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and, and complete the figure by experience of sight. 
I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I'm sure it bends toward justice. The Reverend Dr. King paraphrased the statement into a poetic and powerful phrase that has since been repeated by social activists for many decades. And it's very simply, the, act, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Let us all be reminded of that perspective of the darkest days in our nation and the world as we continue to keep our eyes on the prize. Honors are humbling, especially when they are awarded to you by your friends, neighbors, and colleagues, since they know where many of your warts are. <laughs> I make every effort to resist the temptation to re revel in awards or rest on laurels. Awards are usually given for work that has been done in the past. I choose, on the other hand, to accept awards, and especially this one, as a reminder of the work that remains undone and continues to be needed in the future. And so I accept this prestigious award today as a reminder of the work that I, and indeed all of you on this virtual meeting today, the work that we must continue to do as long as there is breath in our bodies to pursue uncompromisingly the work to achieve social justice for all humankind in our country and the world. Work that is needed just as strongly today as ever. I urge each one of you on this Zoom ceremony today to join me in recommitting ourselves to eliminating all of the isms of the world that divide us, racism, sexism, ageism, and so on as we continue the quest for a just world. Thank you very much again, Fielding, and for the committee and for the Marie Fielder Advisory Council for this most prestigious award that you have bestowed upon me today. I beg all of you in this virtual space to join me also in adhering to the mantra of Walter Annenberg, the late communication tycoon and publisher of TV Guide, who on the occasion of being presented to receive a most prestigious honor at a formal dinner several years ago, uttered only seven words in his acceptance speech and returned to his seat. I did not have the courage to give a seven word acceptance speech today. I wish that I did, <laughs> but at least I would like to leave you with those same seven words in hopes that you remember them if you remember no other words that I've uttered these past few minutes. And those seven words are, the only thing that matters is results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for those very inspiring words. And you are absolutely right. We need to keep moving forward, uh, certainly in these troubled times that are challenging our rights and our democracies. Um, I, as we've mentioned before, the Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership and Education was established in 2016. And I was honored that you invited me to be on advisory council. I knew that with you as the leader, it was going to do some wonderful things in the name of Marie Fielder. So I wanna thank you personally for this opportunity. President Rogers, uh, your guidance and your leadership for fielding has really made a mark in the entire educational community. Uh, we thank you for your efforts and your persistence and your guidance of an uh, institute of higher education that is really focused on non-traditional students. And I think we kind of forget that. Uh, it's unique in its own way. It's unique in its, in its uh, clients. And I think that that's making a big impact. Dr. Early, thank you for your uh, thoughts and your remarks on Orlando, and certainly Dr. Davis White. I thank you for uh, the the importance of understanding and remembering uh, our ecological uh, uh, conditions that we need to protect at all costs. I did want to say that Dr. Taylor's imprint on graduate education, advocacy for underrepresented populations and awareness of the disparities that impact people of color and women in achieving educational equity is undeniably significant, if not remarkable. Um, 
uh, Dr. Ely talked about uh, Orlando as a person and a man, and uh, it's hard not to mention how blessed we are by his wisdom, by his kindness, by his generosity, by his humility, and he's just one terrific human being. My God, uh, he blesses us all in so many different ways. There's a wonderful inside look at Dr. Taylor's academic path, path which uh, Dr. Early had mentioned, some features of it published in the October 28, 2021 issue of Diverse Issues in Higher Education. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to take a look at it. It really does highlight some of the some of the trials and tribulations that he faced, including going to jail. <laughs> and I'll let him explain what, what that's all about. But I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I want to all have us join in giving Dr. Taylor a heartfelt congratulations, well-deserved. And we look forward to many, more, many, many more years of your very important, significant contributions to higher education and to uh, the advancement of our democratic values. Thank you so much, Orlando. Thank you all for being present here today and for joining us for this live event. Please share with friends. We'll see you on the trail, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Gahalva and Trustee Early. Thank you again for being here as well and to all that's made this possible event possible. And with that, I think we are concluded.